Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of my favorite, unnecessarily large, neon-lit, urban city night map, Picad- Oh, I'm sorry, wrong game. Uh, this one is about Miami. Miami is a standard 6v6 map that takes place in... Well, Miami. Moderately open beaches and streets tie together various enclosed shops and buildings full of close quarters combat. Because of this odd mixture, Miami ends up as one of the largest feeling maps in a game that also features a literal armada. For instance, this is the map's full bounds, and now this is the bounds that everyone actually plays on. Like, turns out that there's a marina here. Who knew? Or the lobby for a spa? Or what the hell, is this a diner? I haven't seen one of these things in like eight months. Aesthetically, Miami is one of the most interesting in the franchise, with neon city lights mixing well with the police sirens on the street. Like most Call of Duty maps, there's a small area in the direct center that I like to call the death arena. This is where you go if you wanna die. Oh, but this time there's a resupply cache in the middle. GG, Treyarch. Above it is an overhang where people like to camp and watch over the entire map, except when you're looking at them. A good way to flank around them would be to run off to the right here and cut through the hotel lobby. Just make sure that when you round the corner that you unload your entire magazine into one of these two plants that look exactly like enemies in a panic. Once that's done, awkwardly reload and make your way to room 202, where that camper has undoubtedly placed a mine to stop you from coming inside. Behind all that is a swimming pool, so you can file that one next to the marina and ocean under pointless parts of the map that they only included to show off the swimming mechanics. But this one's got a real working diving board, so you can practice your 360 no-scopes while performing a successful reverse two and a half somersault only to be disappointed by that one French judge who gives you a 6 out of 10. Which actually is a perfect metaphor from my life. Oh look! Over in the alley, there's a subtle reference to me! Oh, I'm humbled. On the water side of the map, you'll see a beached sailboat that, much like me in high school, no one will ever go near unless specifically forced to, and even then they will complain. And then to the north, you'll see a vast open ocean. That's right, north. Like the in-game compass says that is north. Everyone knows that the Atlantic Ocean is off the north coast of Miami, right? We've legitimately looked into this, and turns out the only place in Miami that would have a body of water anywhere near this large to the north of it would be one of the Venetian islands. And not only is that not a downtown area, but even if it was, this bridge would be in clear view, while this appears to be straight up ocean. The sun is even setting in the south. So it's poetic how Miami is actually the perfect metaphor for this game's current state as a whole. You look at this massive offering, full of fun modes and experiences, but when you sit down to actually play through it, you find that it's nothing but incredibly hollow and full of oversights and obvious problems. <coughs> Skill based matchmaking! <coughs> Anyway, I think that's where I will end today's tour. Now, if you'll please exit through the gift shop where you can purchase more highly contrived game metaphors and other literary devices in my new book, Asswalt on the Asphalt. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of my new oversized ant farm, Satellite. Satellite is set in the middle of a desert, based around a crashed satellite nestled neatly into a cliffside. The map is split into two distinctly different pieces, the canyons and the desert, each with its own feel. You see, the desert is where you go if you want to get sniped, and the canyons is where you go if you want to get shotgunned. So really, there's something for everyone. What I'm calling the canyon side of the map is tighter and windy, with more flank routes than an on-demand steak delivery service, which means keeping track of spawns is about as pointless as, well, an on-demand steak delivery service. There's two levels of elevation to this half of the map, the main floor and the dried up riverbed below you, letting you change up your strategy and get a jump on the enemy with each new respawn. 
That said, they usually both lead to the exact same place, so it's really more of a detour that you take every now and then to mix up your commute on the way to your funeral. When you get to the middle, you'll find a crashed satellite on top of a hill. Acting as both the only cover on the map and also the only vantage point, creating a true King of the Hill type experience, propane and all. If you ever get turned around and need to find this place fast, just look to the sky for my float submission for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Besides the center, there's really not too much to the map in terms of cover. There's a few rocks here or there, but most of it's pretty deserted. Get it? Ugh, kill me. Even from above, there's next to no cover. So if you ever hear the words enemy cruise missile above, you might as well wash your hands and set the table because you're about to eat shit. The other half of the map is, well, there's not a lot to say about it. It seems entirely tacked on, like the devs had to hit a quota for square footage and just figured they could throw some sand on it and it would fix itself, like my dad when I fell off my bike and came home with a broken fibia at age six. Despite it being very open, this side of the map is just as hilly, meaning that when you do find someone, the chances of you getting enough bullets into their chest to kill them before they step two feet to the left and are out of view are about as slim as it gets. However, there is a lot to enjoy about this map, like the split pathways that force you to hop the gap like you're a kid jumping from bed to bed in a motel, or that every so often you can run through the entire desert side without seeing anyone so it's like a free trip to the enemy spawn, or that even though air support can be killer, they can also be killed just as easy. And it's that balance, that teeter-totter between open and tight, low and high, sniper and shotgun, that defines satellite as a map. And I think that's where I'll end today's tour. If you wanna see the last one in Miami, you can click right over here, and the rest of you can exit through the gift shop, where you can buy all the sand that was left over after Azir Cave. It's on clearance. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Unclipped Hedges, the game, also known as Cartel. Cartel takes place in Nicaragua, in and around a hangar being used to smuggle drugs and weapons. Much like how Crossroads and Armada have small and large variants for different game modes, Cartel has its 6v6 size and the same map again, but this time with motorcycles. From each spawn, you have your traditional three lanes. There's the stream to the north, which is a straight shot and has by far the most visibility on the map. No one ever goes here. Instead, a lot of the firefight will take place to the south, in and around the hangar. Just be careful if you come up from the west, because they deliberately placed posters directly in your line of sight designed to look like enemies and trip you up. This one is literally holding an AK. Inside the hangar, you'll find enough coke to kill a diabetic on Wall Street. It's also enough to block any and all incoming rounds when you get into a game of Cartel's patented ring around the nose candy with someone on the other team. Oh, and I don't care about Sakaev? These shipping containers are the first Modern Warfare to Black Ops crossover as far as I'm concerned. In the center of the map, there's the infamous bushes, which you can step inside of to perfect your me in high school cosplay. As an extra fuck you, Treyarch put every single objective right here on the set of the Jungle Book, so it's just as hard to see as that live action remake was. You know what, let's play a game, shall we? It's called Where's Woods? Is he A, over here, B, over here, or C, in here? Oh, so close, he wasn't in any of them. See, people only hang out in the bushes when you don't know that they're there. The second that you're made aware of their garden fetish, they like to change it up and camp in other places, like this truck, or the tower, which... God damn it, I hate that tower! A pro tip on those bushes, though, is that you can put a mounted flashlight on your gun to see the other team's names through the leaves and weed them out. There's no joke here, I just miss being helpful and don't want to get typecast. Another popular spot is this window, because it's the only other proper vantage point, which really doesn't cover much, so it creates this kind of interesting loop where someone camps and picks you off on the inside, so you get mad and go to get revenge, but before you get there, they get bored and leave to go hide in a bush somewhere. So when you arrive in the room, you expect someone inside, but it's completely empty. Oh well, you think to yourself before getting a quick kill out the window and thus repeating the cycle. 
And while it might sound harmless, I promise you that it isn't. Right here is a heat map of the United States, denoting where cartel is played the most. And here are similar heat maps, but for the rate of self-harm, suicide, felony arrests, and being a leech on your family who have had much higher hopes for you than this. When you dive into the data, you can see just how things like this can affect your mood, your physical health, and, and even your life. So I beg you, as tempting as it is to keep climbing up this tower to get a revenge kill, as much as you feel the need to mow your LMG through these bushes, as much as you're dependent on that fix of finally smoking that camper out of this window, it's not worth it. Just say no to cartel and drugs and Scientology. Actually, I hear those dipshits are trying to make a comeback. So that's where I'll end today's tour. Uh, if you want to see the last one we did in Cold War, you can click right here. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, which is definitely not a front. <laughs> where, where, where'd you get that idea? What, are you a cop? You gotta tell me if you're a cop. Oh, no, no, I don't think you're a cop. Uh, seriously, though, you, uh, you looking to buy? Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of a gray concrete rainforest, Moscow. Now, believe it or not, Moscow takes place in the heart of Russia during the height of the Cold War. Its influences are subtle, but if you really dig deep, you'll be able to pick out the clues. It's dreary, drab, and another D word that makes me want to just cozy up on the couch and gargle a jug of battery acid. And I'll never understand why this map was so highly requested for us to do a tour of. The long and short of the map is that there are two large buildings in spawn that might as well not even be playable areas because no one uses them. And between them is a metro that everyone gravitates to like it's a Walmart that just got a new shipment of three PS5s. And of course, this is a Black Ops Cold War map, so there is its signature open, please use me to flank side, which has been on every map that we've looked at thus far. This time, it's a road and has a decent chunk of cover on it including these cable cars that I only mention because the wires turn into stretchy jump ropes when a grenade so much as breathes on them. Directly off the street is a courtyard, with two windows on opposite ends that will always be locked into a stalemate, rendering them useless. Behind the western window is a small hallway that acts as a crossroads between the outside world and the metro. It contains a bar serving the finest physics-bending cocktails and an office with a workday that never ends. Man, with this kind of tech, I'm surprised they didn't beat us to the soundstage where they shot the moon landing. Then we get to my favorite part of the map, breaking glass windows. It's all the fun of Modern Warfare's doors, but with more lacerations. Once our sinuses are nice and sliced open, we'll make our way to the center metro, which I like to call the Deadly Donut, or shrine to Russian man who sits like a girl. When entering this area, you'll be keen to look out for campers in any of these three corners or on this raised platform. If you don't see anyone there, then first, go ahead and record that clip and take it down to your nearest 7-Eleven, because in 18 states, that legally counts as a winning lotto ticket. And second, you might want to turn around, because they're definitely behind you. If you take the escalators up, you'll be at the other main choke point of the map. But don't worry, the Russian god of chocolate coins is there to keep you safe. Despite losing the space race, Moscow does take home the crown for the most pointless routes on the map. Like this path that was just added because nobody told the stonemason he could go home early. Or this random thick pillar here that serves no purpose. Or all this free space behind both spawns. You can even go inside of the rail car, which I have yet to see anyone actually use in-game, and honestly, it's somehow the most unsettling thing about this map. All in all though, Moscow doesn't really have too many defining features, and maybe that in of itself defines it better than I ever could. There's no gimmicks, there's no over-the-top colors, or a super out-there layout. It's basically another three-lane city map that we've seen for nearly two decades, and that's okay. Perhaps that's actually the best way that it fits into its setting. It's standardized, conventional, stock, unified. Next to all the others, it's so unremarkable that it actually becomes the opposite.
And I think that's where I'll end today's tour. If you want to see the last one we did, you can click right over here. Or you can exit through the gift shop where you can buy golden busts of vaguely Russian looking men. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of the fourth map set in the United States in a game that's not set in the United States, Raid. Raid is a Black Ops 2 map remastered for the next generation in Cold War. It's a fan favorite, and given its setting, and how much it was requested to get a remake all these years, I'm surprised someone from FaZe hasn't already made their own IRL version. On the surface, it's simple. Three lanes. The front, center, and backyard of what's technically a house? Honestly, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the layout. The garage is on the far east side, disconnected from the rest of the house, then there's the bedroom, with a nice view of the pool below, but, uh, there's nothing else connected to it. The kitchen, laundry room, and office are all across the property, with no actual connections between them that is an outdoor patio space. You expect someone to carry all their laundry from this building over here, all the way through the garden, what's basically an outdoor kitchen, courtyard, and pool, just to get up to the bedroom? What if it rains? What happens after dark? And then once you even get here, where are you even putting it? There's no dresser. Unless you're telling me that this here is a closet, in which case the bedroom is even more disconnected from anything at all. Sorry, sorry, I digress. Did I mention that this mansion comes with a panic room with a convenient window inside, completely defeating the purpose of a fucking panic room? Despite the logistical problems of owning such a poorly thought out floor plan, the devs actually did a very good job of converting this map into the current age. They made sure to include all the fun little easter eggs from the original, like the basketballs that you can shoot into the basket, like so. And I mean look at these appliances! The fridge is so shiny I found out I'm a vampire! Even the origami dog shit fountain out front is just downright stunning. And while the majority of this map seems untouched from the original, there are a few key differences. For instance, the 2025 style flat screens have been replaced with CRTVs or paintings to fit the time period. And the nice cars in the garage have been swapped out with models that were actually around in the 80s. And you can finally swim in the pool before it was outlawed in the late 1990s. From Raid's signature infinity pool to its elementary school drop-off driveway and bold art choice, this map both looks and plays exactly like it did back in Black Ops 2, which is far from a bad thing. In fact, I'll go on record saying that this is the perfect remake because it's just the same map again. It's not a shipping yard disguised as a paintball arena, or a cruise ship that flies now, or a terminal but on the moon. They didn't take some TikTok group's mansion and turn it into a Roman villa for some reason. They took the map that you love for its design, but also for its aesthetic, and they brought it into the modern era without breaking it or the core systems and lore that the current game has established. And if this is the bar, then I'm excited to see what the Express remaster will look like in a few weeks. And you know, with that, I think I'm going to end today's tour. If you like this kind of video, consider subscribing to help us reach our goal of building our very own raid, also known as Replay Mode Headquarters. And click right here to see the last tour that we did on Moscow. Everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where pool floaties and life jackets are available for purchase at a very hefty markup. Take care now, and don't drown. Hi. My name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of a Back to the Future fan's wet dream, Twin Pines Mall. I, I, I mean, uh, Mall at the Pines. Are it, it's just the Pines, uh, I guess? The Pines is set in the colon of New Jersey, which is basically just all of Jersey, in a classic 80s style mall, complete with legally distinct stores based off of ones that you love to see go out of business. Like Radio House, 
for those who remember buying radios and being able to afford to buy houses, Wingnuts, which correctly predicted the downfall of Toys R Us, CD Station, which is like SoundCloud, but you actually pay for shitty up-and-coming rappers, poorly mixed mumbles and drum slaps, and really the rest of the stores, which tells a tale of a time before Lord Bezos decided we all needed urinal cakes on demand. As far as gameplay goes, the map is full of close quarters combat, running in and out of stores and corridors that all somehow look the same. I've never once played this map without feeling like a lost child screaming out for his mother after bolting for the Auntie Anne's only to find her two feet to my left. In the center, you'll find a fountain, acting as a fulcrum where a bunch of different paths converge. Just next to it is this golden car, which I guess is where all the paint they were supposed to use on camos went. But that's not all. As you stumble your way around the mall like a blind puppy in the dark, you might find yourself bumping into the food court, which is equipped to seat eight, or the least diverse arcade I've ever seen, complete with a snack bar full of Mountain Dew, Doritos, and something called a Jersey Crunch, which I'm assuming is like a normal candy bar, but it has a spray tan and talks through its nose. There's also escalators that are really stairs, elevators that are really ladders, and literal explosive barrels that don't explode. Then there's the outside component of the map, which only exists as a spawn for one of the two teams, and so they can technically call it a snow map. Plus, they can fit even more pointless 80s references outside, I guess. Now, I've been getting lost in this place for a couple of hours straight now, and I don't know, something about running around an outdated arena inside of a game that most of the industry at large considers a dying franchise itself feels a little poetic. Gone are the glory days of MW2, World at War, the Black Ops crew that people actually liked. They've all closed up shop, being replaced with lifeless imitations built by algorithms to squeeze every last dime out of us before closing a year later and bringing a new pile of shiny nothing to the table. Call of Duty is nothing but this very mall full of shitty knockoffs. Weapons that we loved are reskinned and renamed watered down parodies dripped to us slowly as a marketing tactic. Pay for what you want DLC packs have been replaced with FOMO season passes that end up more expensive in the long run. Gameplay mechanics get renamed year after year to trick you into thinking that things have been improved and have gotten better, but we still have the same issues year after year. And with the rate that things are going, it's only a matter of time before, like malls, doors on Call of Duty begin getting shut for good. But as seemingly awful these things might appear to be, and as much as we miss the glory days and wish that things would be different, at least we can take solace in the fact that our mall isn't in New Jersey. And I think that's where I'll end today's tour. Uh, a huge shout out to everyone on stream the other day who helped me write this thing. A uh, huge thanks, couldn't do it without them. Like, seriously. Um, if you're curious, you can click right here to see the saved archive from our little writing session, uh, or you can click right over here to see the last tour that we did on Raid. And everyone else can exit through the literal gift shop, where you can book tickets on the first flight anywhere that isn't this hellscape. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of the only place where it's less socially acceptable to get hit by a train than real life, Express. Express is a pretty standard, symmetrical map whose claim to fame is a real working train, slicing down the middle as a relic of a time when Call of Duty loved using modes of transportation as dynamic map elements. Going along the train tracks, you'll find various small combat areas, where for some reason snipers love to shoot and miss at people just trying to cross the map. The center of this area is the control center, which might as well be a tent for all the campers and train hobos to spend the night. If anyone is... who am I kidding? To get the guy camping up here watching the ladder, always remember that you can climb up through these windows, just like my wife the morning after she snuck out of the house to see your cute rock climbing instructor she sweared was only a friend. However, if you are able to get into the building, then you'll have a great view of the tracks below and can spot people ducking and weaving through the stationary train or getting shot into lower orbit by the moving train. Speaking of, when the train comes by every few minutes, it can block off some key routes to other parts of the map. 
Thankfully, if you need to cross in a pinch, both sides have sky bridges connecting them back to the main terminal. You can also use these to hop on top of the stationary train to cross the map quickly while being a little more exposed. There's also these birds up here that have nerves of steel and bodies of birds. A few feet past the bullet train is the platform, which perfectly mirrors on the center, meaning that they create identical opening routes for both teams. So while you might think that you're getting a jump on the other side by running up to this trash can and slowly peeking your head out, there's an identical parallel universe version of yourself doing the same thing on the other side. And it's important to remember that alternate universe you is always better than this universe you. Then lastly, there's the terminal on the far north side, which is about as open and as spacious as my apartment, and just like my home, no one ever bothers coming here, except in objective game modes or when I call maintenance to fix my crippling loneliness. There's also a resupply crate in the elevator here, which I guess explains how all these armed men got onto the platform, despite them all still having to take their damn shoes off at TSA. So there you have it, Express just how it was in Black Ops 2. Full of campers, out of place snipers, and a bullet train that's more deadly than a bullet. B bullet. And that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to vote on what map you want us to do a tour of next over on our community page. Also, check out our accurate guide series with Rayola. It's honestly so much better than anything I do. I'm a useless hack. Who wrote that? Uh, uh, and everyone else can exit through the gift shop where you can buy train bullets. Tra train, train bullets. See, I'm not a useless hack. Fuck you. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Cold War's number one map, alphabetically, Armada Strike. Armada is located in the Pacific Ocean and tells the story of the real-life Project Azorian which found the CIA retrieving a sunken Soviet submarine. Bet you can't say that ten times fast. However, unlike the project, there doesn't appear to be any crew on board. Now my theory on that is that they all jumped overboard after having flashbacks of the last time that Call of Duty had a map take place on a ship. The map takes the standard three-lane approach and jumbles it like a pool table on a cruise by adding upper and lower deck paths on the sides and a connecting bridge in the middle. These sides are where 90% of your time will be spent, with the other 10 looking out at the rest of the vessels that unfortunately had their numbers called in this giant game of Battleship. Speaking of, I think someone's cheating, because at the center of the main boat is an entire submarine, creating the center lane's signature toilet bowl feel. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can get down to the bottom. There's these zip lines, parachuting, the ladder, jumping off into the water, or not realizing that you've already taken damage and breaking your face on the porcelain. But you don't want to stay down in the bowl for very long though, because sooner or later a camper is going to come and flush you out faster than a Yellowstone port john on the 4th. Instead, from this lane you can head up to the aforementioned bridge, which you'd think would be a choke point but is somehow the quietest part of the map, or you can zip all the way up to the middle control room which despite having five entrances, is surprisingly hard to flank into. From this room, you have free reign over the entire deck, and because every Cold War map is built by making half a map, dipping in ink and folding it over on top of itself, you can keep an eye on the enemy spawn, and once they flip, thanks to symmetry, you can too. If there's one takeaway from this map, it's the unique nature of its pathways how it's somehow contained but open at the same time. How there's a limitless number of ways you can get from point A to point B, and only some of them end in certain death. And it's refreshing. As refreshing as diving headfirst into this crisp, unpolluted nuclear bomb water. Even though it's technically part of a larger map, Armada Strike never feels rushed. While the devs could have just cordoned off a small area of the larger map, collected a COD point paycheck and called it a day, they instead took the time to thoroughly fine tune and polish what's probably the more played of the two, and they did it while maintaining the core of what this level has to offer. Swimming mechanics that get you across the map fast. 
zip lines that you can climb up and rappel off of to get the jump on people, and shipping containers that are floating over the open ocean. That, that last one doesn't make a lot of sense, but, uh, but, but I'm glad that it's there. And that's the end of today's boat tour. I want to thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, you can click right over here to see the last one we did on Express. Man, we're really on a vehicle kick today. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where we're running a two-for-one on Repel Zippy thingies. What, what are they called? Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswell. Welcome to a tour of... Wait, is this an original non-remake DLC map? They're allowed to do that? Apocalypse. Apocalypse takes place in Laos, as a team of woods face off against a team of Port Novas in the biggest mess to take place near Vietnam since the Gallon Challenge made its way to the international food aisle. What's this about a war? This map was released as part of the second Cold War DLC, and despite the name, and it being an otherwise zombies-based season, and this purple gas, which is the exact same shade as Outbreak, it has nothing to do with the zombies mode. Instead, the name is actually a reference to Apocalypse Now, a classic 1970s film that was pretty alright, but because the production crew were so miserable making it, we all have to be miserable too, and claim it's the greatest story ever told, despite it being all over the place. And speaking of things that are all over the place, uh, this map. Apocalypse is broken down into two sections, the temple and the village. The temple is smaller and mostly a spawn for one of the two teams. Dark and eerie, it's rich in history and gold, like a shitload of gold. Like when converted to US dollars, we're looking at 21 million. And yet they still didn't hire an actual contractor to do the remodel. As you make your way through the temple, you'll pass by statues of the Vietnamese gods of violin banjos and baby heads. And don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to pay your respects while you're spawn trapped inside by a VTOL every single game. Although, once you do make it outside of the worship chamber and into the village, you'll find yourself on a small road that might seem like the only place to go, but there's actually virtually limitless places to branch out onto. There's the war room and the attached platform to run across, or you can sneak under it and along the cliffside and through this downed helicopter. There's also the ruins of the temple on the opposite side, which winds and connects back to the road near the center truck. The thing to remember about this center though is that no matter what, you are always exposed to no less than five hostile paths. So if you hear gunshots and think you have them zeroed in, think again. They're actually coming from a completely different direction. And unbeknownst to you, you've been in three separate gunfights this whole time. And just like your parents' divorce, no one thought to tell you. Now there's a number of points of interest around the village that I'd like to direct your attention to. Like the interrogation room, which is a reference to the first and only good Black Ops campaign, hello comment section, or Chicken Wall, where we commemorate all the poultry fallen victim to prop hunt. Then there's this rejected gunfight map, which somehow snuck its way in, and the beautiful Laos landscape. I know that things can get heated out here, but try to take some time to take it all in every once in a while, and remind yourself what you're fighting for in this very necessary war. <sighs> that view. And I think that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to click right here to check out the last one we did on Armada. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop where we're having a clearance sale on gold bars. Turns out they're completely worthless over here. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Florida again, but this time during the day, Miami Strike. So it looks like the devs took our complaints to heart and shrunk Miami down from the size of an aircraft carrier down to about the size of a car carrier. And honestly, that part feels just about perfect. And don't adjust your brightness, that blinding light that you're seeing is just the sun that's finally reared its head on the city after five months of darkness. While Miami Strike is of course a variant of the larger map, 
there are actually some major key design changes. And that starts with this version being set on the day of the world's smallest car show, which helps shift the map's focus from the otherwise empty streets to instead the back alley which used to just be a flanking route, but is now the main choke point. A real rags to riches story. The interiors are also slightly changed, like the hotel that adopted a more open floor plan. And there's even completely new areas, like the road leading into the parking garage. There's a new ladder out by spawn that opens up a fast way of getting to this overwatch position, only countered by the new additional overwatch that they made out of scaffolding on the other side. Overall, this map holds up the tradition of the Strike version being miles better than the normal map. That said, where are we? Because just like the other version of the map, the in-game compass still says we're off the north coast of Miami, which doesn't exist. And while you can plug the addresses on the street into Google Maps and you get a very similar looking strip on the east side of South Beach, there's also some addresses that line up perfectly with the west side of the beach. Then there's the problem of the entire 14 blocks of this island that are just missing. And when you look at the flyers at the car show, it describes a giveaway for an all expense paid trip to South Beach, which would be a ridiculous prize for someone who is currently in South Beach, coupled with the clocks on both versions of the map reading the same time and taking place on the same date, meaning that they'd have to be exactly 12 hours apart despite the major construction projects that would have to get done in that time in a world 20 years before Extreme Makeover Home Edition had premiered on ABC. All of which leads me to believe that someone at Treyarch doesn't quite know their history. Yep, that was, that was the end of that joke. Um, anyway, that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, consider buying a Captain Rayola dog tag. Uh, and the rest of you can exit through the gift shop where you can buy the neon lights that we no longer need because it's about to be daylight for the next five months. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt and welcome to a tour of the 84th Nuketown remake, Nuketown 84. A decade after the original, and it looks like this fake town is still standing, despite a nuke destroying it every single time that we play. Unlike the future versions of this map, this one has the exact same geometry and structure as the original, just aged and desecrated to match the franchise. It also kind of looks like a bunch of kids showed up to draw dicks on everything. So suffice to say, this is the most realistic iteration yet. For those who've never played this map before, it consists of two houses on opposite sides of a cul-de-sac. A yellow house and a green house. Or, for the colorblind, a green house and another green house. Nuketown is the definition of a standard three-lane design, with straight shots through each house and on the sides, with cross paths in between created by the bus and a truck illegally parked on the road. It's small. The smallest in the game, in fact, but yet still about six times the size of shipment, which means that it still has some semblance of structure when played. So while it is fast paced, I can't exactly fault it for being too chaotic, like the aforementioned shipping yard. You always know what's happening. You know that if you spawn in the backyard of one building, then the enemies are in the other. And if you spawn in the cul-de-sac, then you know you're getting fucked. Aesthetically, you'll notice a distinct 80s feel to everything, from the newly added arcade machines to the mannequin's wardrobe. The graffiti all around the map speaks of anti-war, just like the populace of the time, which is ironic considering that Nuketown itself has been the third leading cause of violence since 2010, just behind traffic jams and grandparents who don't understand how not to download a virus with their disability checks. At the end of the day though, it's the same old Nuketown. The same insanely hard to cap B flag, the same campers on the top of the stairs, the same RCXD path that few realize is there and even fewer bother even using. The same yellow and green backyards where amidst the chaos, we can feel safe for a short period of time. And that's what Nuketown is. Those backyards, safety in the land of chaos. In a world of change, while not perfect, Nuketown is preserved. You know that no matter what, it will be there. 
whether you like it or not, and it will always end the same. And that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed and want to see more Nuketown, we actually did a full tour on the original right here. Or if you want to see more in Cold War, then we have a playlist you can check out right here. Everyone else can exit through the gift shop, which is actually just this map again. We are selling the clothes off the mannequins. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of my Hay Suppliers Distribution Center, Standoff. Standoff, of course, is a faithful remake of the Black Ops 2 map of the same name, and it serves as a constant reminder of the COD Golden Age, and how no amount of new paint or melted Bruce Willis's... W will I? No, Willis's will ever bring us back there. And despite being one of the most boring looking maps out there, Standoff is actually one of the most requested remakes in the entire franchise. Seeing five total games to date, including being the worst gulag layout in all of Verdansk. Can we please go back to the showers? Like that at least was cool. This is plywood. Now this particular version of Standoff is an exact one-to-one -one port without any major changes, which like most other Cold War remakes is a breath of fresh air. I'm looking at you 2019 vacant. Located in Kyrgyzstan, the small farm village has everything for the four and a half people who must live here, including a gas station, graveyard, statue of a priest mid heart attack, and enough hay to feed an entire cavalry regiment. Military still used horses in the 80s, right? If you don't enjoy your stay though, tough luck. Because some rogue conductor just left a bunch of train cars blocking the road out of here. So it looks like the only real way out is by becoming the 10th grave in the makeshift cemetery slash pig farm. And if you did drive here, Good luck parking, because despite six businesses sharing the same small block, there are exactly zero parking spots. So I can't exactly blame these tanks for double parking on the main strip. It's really just the farm town, but with way too many places of business concentrated in one spot for some reason. Like, like who is staying in this hotel? Is the yearly hay bale conference being held in the open space in this family's kitchen? Like we're reaching dark ether levels of floor plans that make no sense. Now as far as gameplay goes, Standoff is, you guessed it, a three lane map, and if I'm being honest, it's pretty middle of the road, by taking place in the middle of a road. Each side capped off by two story buildings, with windows for camping snipers to do their camping sniper thing, in what we like to call the Russian Standoff, where they will be pinned in a never ending battle of perseverance and sweatiness, with mines at their back to keep off anyone who actually wants to play the damn game. The rest of the players will fight through the middle and sides of this hay rodeo, working their way through key locations, such as House, which is about as descriptive as these in-game callouts get, the world's second saddest playground, losing only to the play place they built in that amputee hospital ward, Store, with the cheapest ice cream known to man. Also, what's up with convenience stores and COD games having staircases in the middle of the main room? I've never been to a 7-Eleven that had its own banister. There's also the aforementioned hotel in the middle of the map, which I actually stayed at, and I gotta tell ya, Worst experience of my life. The sleeping arrangements sucked, they still had their Halloween decorations up, there was no continental breakfast, the mattress was just a hay bale covered in a sheet, and the wake up call I asked for was a tank shell through the roof. Would not recommend. Speaking of recommending things though, I actually highly recommend this map. The classic holds up and provides all the fast paced fun of Black Ops 2, with the only downside being, like the rest of the game, Oh, and a severe lack of shipping containers. There's not a single one on this entire map. Trust me, we checked. And that's where we'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you so much to everyone who stopped by the other day to help write this thing on stream. If you want to check out the last tour we did on Nuketown 84, you can click right here. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop where we're selling some of these goddamned hay bales. Is that beaten horse dead yet? Oh, that's probably why there's so much leftover hay. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Air Force Point Five, also known as Checkmate.
Checkmate takes place in an old aircraft hangar, refurbished into a Spec Ops training facility, complete with plywood structures, targets, and red arrows pointing to very obvious things. Hey, wait a minute. The map is set entirely indoors, but unlike a lot of indoor maps in the franchise, Checkmate is actually quite large, with open spaces and sight lines located all around the warehouse floor to run around in. In the center, you'll find a mock fuselage of Air Force One, which serves as the princess castle, or giant golf ball of the map. With stairs leading inside on both ends, the plane acts as a natural point of collision for the two teams. Because I'm sure whatever Russian team is using this to train with has already come up with a surefire plan to just bypass the cockpit entirely, which I think would cause a lot more issues. The inside is small, tight, and really only has enough room for one person to squeeze by, with featureless mannequins and cutouts on your peripheral as you tunnel vision your way down to your target just like a real airplane. On the sides of the aircraft are the wings, which serve as power positions, watching over each spawn and allowing for quick and easy access to the interior, for when you have a guy camping the stairs like a flight attendant handing out wet wipes so you can lie to yourself and say that the screen you're about to watch the first half of Tenon on wasn't just spat up on by a screaming toddler. Under the wings creates a canopy of sorts, with its own small space to hang out and try catching people running across the ungodly large open space Space between cover. But the plane is only part of what Checkmate has to offer. Oh, wait, no, sorry, that's a typo. Uh, it actually is all that Checkmate has to offer. Because the rest of this map is about as pointless as a senior discount at a Chuck E. Cheese. On the west side of the map, you'll find a small wooden kill house coming off spawn that effectively serves as a pathway to the center. A little ways off of that is an overwatch tower, which no one goes up into until one person does, and then you'll spend the entire game trying to get them out. Then there's a barracks type area, completely outside of the main hangar, which I can only assume they added as a safe spawn point, but that really doesn't mesh when there's already an absurdly large spawn area right next to it. And that's only the west half of the map. For the east, take everything that I said, except add a few more shipping containers for good measure. Now, Checkmate is a very difficult map to figure out. It's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, mixing far sniping sight lines with incredibly tight choke points stitching them together. It's absolutely massive and open, but the entire thing feels constrained because of its interior setting. And even aesthetically, it feels like it's trying to be the next firing range, terminal, kill house, nuketown, and shipment all rolled up into one kaleidoscope. Going into Cold War's release, I thought that I would enjoy Checkmate a lot more than I did, probably because I really enjoyed those aforementioned classic maps. However, despite the setting, Checkmate really doesn't feel like any of those. It feels like they just took Kill House and scaled it up by two and a half times, without adding anything new to fill in the gaps, creating this feeling of an outdoor map that they tried squishing into an indoor map. And that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and check out the last one we did right here. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where all proceeds will go directly to the lawsuit that we're filing against Treyarch for using our trademarked red arrows. That's right, you'll be hearing from our lawyer. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary S. Walt, and welcome to a tour of yet another BO2 map, Hijack. Hijacked is back as the fourth Black Ops 2 remake for Cold War, which apparently is the only game that Treyarch is proud of anymore. And like usual, it's an exact one-to-one -one replica, but with a muted color palette and more TVs. As I'm sure you could tell by now, it takes place entirely on a YouTuber's yacht, with each team starting on the bow or stern and working their way in to conflict in the middle. Each side has their respective indoor area with a chaotic bottom and a more chill upstairs that overlooks the center where most of the fight happens, both complemented with large spawns behind each building and flank routes for easily getting past. Which sounds a little familiar, 
But there actually is one major difference between this layout and Nuketown, and that's the engine room below deck, which acts as a super highway between spawns and a nice camping spot from the hardpoint gods decide you're not worthy. Which brings us to the one tangible difference between this version and the original Hijacked, and that is this vent, which used to be like a drop box for grenades, letting you smoke out people camping below, but now is just a regular old wall. They didn't think we'd notice, but I noticed. I noticed this teeny tiny itty bitty feature that no one used or probably even knew was there, and that, that probably says a lot more about me, actually. Overall, Hijacked is a good, fast-paced map, where I'd recommend using the new nail gun, also known as the reason that every lobby has been a thumper and crossbow fest this weekend, which is super overboard for a weapon that gets disabled by a trophy system. Oh, dude, but the dude, they shoot nails, crazy. And that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, you can click right here to check out the last one that we did on Checkmate. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where we're just selling Black Ops 2 again, I guess. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Cold War's not really 2v2 maps. Walking in Modern Warfare's footsteps, Treyarch recently introduced a variety of pocket-sized maps built for non-respawn 2v2 gunfights. However, nobody played them. So, like usual, they just upped the player count and suddenly it's everyone's favorite game mode. Kinda like how the Slinky wasn't originally meant to be a kid's toy until someone decided it was way more lucrative to just push it down the stairs than whatever the hell bad idea it was supposed to be for. At the time of this tour, there are a total of eight itsy bitsy shooty spaces that all range from incredibly tiny to, what is this, a Call of Duty for ants? For starters, there's Diesel, which takes place at the gas station where I go once a week looking for my father who said he was leaving to buy cigarettes 10 years ago. The more open interstate is contrasted by the close quarters trailers, which is the perfect spot to shotgun a beer or the enemy. KGB takes us to the USSR, where the USA DOA some SOBs, and KIA their IRL ADD with prompt returns to the DZ. Use HEs and your standard MG to BRB the enemy ASAP. MIA? Try the ABV like an MPD UAV for the AFK APs and MSG their END. And speaking of gibberish, next up is ICBM, which stands for Intense Castrating Bowel Movement. Or at least that's what it feels like when playing what might officially be the smallest map in the game's history, with the only real cover from accidental spawn camping being below the rocket in the center. From there, we'll hop a train over to u -bond, as in u -bond from the channel if you say anything bad about my personal favorite map. Something about the cramped space and kind of orderly, but also kind of not layout, and the trash and graffiti everywhere just reminds me of my own mental state around this time in every Call of Duty's life cycle. Also in the rotation is Nuketown, which if you don't know about at this point, you're beyond helping. Surprisingly, it's one of the largest in this category. It's like when a really annoying person starts hanging out exclusively with people who end tweets with, that's it, that's the tweet, so they look less unfunny by comparison. And Mansion is what happens when one dev looks to the other and says, what if we made a super tiny map, but name it after a type of building known for being so big that it is only reserved for the likes of space aliens, space explorers, and those who don't pay taxes. Game Show is one of the most interesting in the game, letting you live out your dreams of being on a knockoff Price is Right. Fight through the green rooms and backstage with the hopes of staying alive long enough to win a free car. Some conditions apply. Then lastly, we have the newest map, Amsterdam, which finally answers the question, what the hell are your upstairs neighbors doing when you're trying to sleep? And that's all of them, for now at least anyway. You know, you never know when Treyarch's gonna accidentally drop one of these things through the floorboards at their weekly what kind of a mask should the new operator have meeting. So that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out the last one that we did on Hijacked, you can click right here. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, which I'm being told is running a BOGO on Froyo to go Yo. 
Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of Spoli... Spoli? Spoli Paintball Park, a.k.a. Rush. Tis the season for another Call of Duty remake to hit the new game. And once again, they went with one from BO2 instead of the game that was literally placed in the same time period. Set in Georgia, the state, not the painter, Rush drops us into a paintball arena, full of light cover and close quarter combat. Aesthetically, the map looks and feels like a middle school birthday party, finally giving CDL skins a place to fit in. We can split Rush into four distinct quadrants, each with their own feel. The arena, yard, alley, and parking lot. Let's start with the yard. Being the largest area on the map, it's littered with fake, but not fake, but it is still a video game, so it is fake, cover every few feet, making it feel like a guided maze through the dirt. Nearly every wall out here has these gun glory holes cut out of them, so you can remain anonymous while head glitching the other team into the aforementioned dirt. On one end, there's a bus, which usually I'd tell you to look out for, but honestly, it's no better of a vantage point than standing next to the bus. In the middle of the yard is the center, where every path on the map converges into one hectic bullet tornado. From here, you can run up this ramp and jump into the window for a quick getaway to the next section of the map, the alley. Serving as an express lane between spawns, the alley provides the only elevation to the park. It's made up of two sections, the windows staring directly at each other, guaranteeing that neither team will get to use them for their intended purpose, and the interior hallway, a long, straight line where there's always someone waiting to pick you off the second you start sprinting through it. Across the map is the arena, a mid-sized paintball field that acts as its own mini three-lane map. It's like an easy-bake oven, but for junior game devs. It's overlooked by the control room through a glass window that really shouldn't be this easy to break, considering it's literally facing a paintball arena. Attached is the shop, where you can buy overpriced skins for characters no one likes, and variants with the same energy of every PC case made after 2015. Wait, no, sorry, that's the in-game store. <laughs> My mistake. Then lastly, we have the parking lot. And there's really not a lot to say about it. It's basically just a spawn full of cars that, I guess, spontaneously combusted? Uh, I I'm not really sure of the lore here. What does it say is the story behind this map? Oh, Perseus. Well, that just makes a lot of sense. And that's where we'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. Quick shout out to our $10 channel members, Iju Krya, Sacred Moose, Shane M, and Gorda Rokos. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to become a channel member and get to watch these videos early, you can click that join button down below. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where we now offer window repair. Turns out it's an incredibly lucrative business around these parts. Hi. My name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and welcome to a tour of the coldest map in a game called Cold War, Crossroads. Crossroads Strike centers around two buildings of a Soviet facility, and is actually the smallest non-Nuketown 6v6 map in the game, which automatically makes it the best non-Nuketown 6v6 map in the game. The layout is simple. From each spawn, you can go to the left, right, or straight through the buildings, with a middle alleyway between them to cross from the inside to the outside lanes quickly. Most of the outdoor action tends to congregate by the vehicle on the north side, as it has a decent amount of cover, and it's where three of those routes converge. Enjoy a quick game of Ring Around the Rosie as you keep an eye out for this bad guy mounting up by the flatbed in this little V, which stands for Very Good Player. It's a good spot for SMGs, perfectly juxtaposed by the south side, which like most maps in this game, is an open route between spawns. Over here, you'll want to be careful of the cliffside overlooking the whole thing, where enemies can post up to pick you off. One thing you could do to combat campers on that side is to hop on top of the shipping crate to have the same view back at them. No one ever does this. Instead, most will charge headlong into the cliffside, like a triathlon on Normandy Beach. But thankfully, if you're the lucky one to get past, there's plenty of ways to get up on top of the cliff from the bottom, like the barrels, box, or other barrels. 
Indoors Moyer style? Well, like we mentioned, Crossroads Strike has two main buildings to fight through, but unlike most maps, there are no front-facing windows to create this base versus base feeling, and instead it's just fast-paced gunfights throughout. The inclusion of the catwalk ties them both together to feel like one single structure, which helps it flow better than a freestyle competition in the Amazon. For being a standard three-lane layout on the surface, Crossroads threads the needle for a well-made map. It's symmetrical without being symmetrical, and with the exception of a single door being closed here, the entire map is open. There's no invisible walls keeping us on rails because the game is too afraid of letting you off the leash. There's no weird gerrymandered bounds. It doesn't feel like it was deliberately made to fit this 3x3 three three grid. And while yes, Crossroads Strike is a standard three-lane map, it's an example of why they work and an example of it done right. And you know what? That's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out the last one that we did, you can click right here. And everyone else can exit through the gift shop, where we have a clearance sale on unmarked barrels. They're like those surprise kids toys, except way more lead poisoning. Hi, my name is Lieutenant Gary Aswalt, and it's been quite a while since I did a tour of a Cold War map. I guess I was too distracted by not liking the game at all. So you know what? Let's just knock out the rest of these DLC maps in one single video. So welcome to a tour of every new Cold War map that you've already forgotten about. Echelon, Drive-In, Slums, Zoo, America, and Deprogram. Strap in. First, let's talk about Echelon. Located on top of a German broadcast facility, Echelon breaks up the flow of a standard map by having giant holes in the middle, some of which you can jump over and some of which you can't. Run along the edges to rub your parkour skills into your friends' faces while also getting there in the same amount of time. Then moving over to Drive-In, where it looks like the devs finally remembered what game this is a sequel of and started going back to Black Ops DLC maps? Drive-In is basically the same as it always was. A dilapidated drive-in theater during a time where they weren't dilapidated yet, which centers on a huge no man's land that if you walk through, you'll be forcibly silenced by the theater attendants even though the movie hasn't started yet. After that, it looks like they also remade Zoo from Black Ops 1. Now this map I remember fondly from my glory days, running across the monorail, hanging out in the animal prisons, and doing a little bird watching. But loading into it now, the map feels off. Something about the colors, or maybe the fact that it's been 10 years since I've played it last, or maybe it's because they just sliced half the map off. Yeah, that... That's probably it. And I have no idea why they chose this specific map to do that with, when the rest of the remakes in this game are perfectly one-to-one. -one. It'd be like if they remade Star Wars for the 68th time, and this go-around, when they got up to Empire, they decided to just cut all mention of Darth Vader and add some color correction. You know, just to be wacky. And on the topic of remakes, we've also been gifted slums. Eh, it's slums. Then America finally takes us to the one location from the campaign that we've all been waiting to see. Inside of a Russian training ground modeled to look like good old US of A, America is complete with a movie theater, bar, and burger town with a Russian menu? Is this an actual operating burger town for the Soviets while like on break? Because the rest of the town is 100% English right down to the prices outside on the sign. Wait, only 30 cents for a child-sized juice? That's a bargain! And finally, the last map is Deprogram. The entire map takes place inside of Adler's numbers-infested head, clashing elements from previous DLC maps into one collage, full of glitches and dreamlike effects, like Stitch just creepily watching you from the great beyond. Scattered around are red doors that when you step inside of, you're instantly teleported to a lab in the center, which doubles as the set of every cut video. Now these maps all look great, and I'm sure that they also play great. Uh, if I, if I were to play them. See, this is the part of the video where I wrap everything up into a perfectly worded metaphor and speak heroically as the music builds, like I'm giving a speech at the end of Independence Day, but honestly, I just don't care. 
It's the last DLC, and it's normal by the time we make it here to be burnt out. But I'm not burnt out, I'm just bored. And thus ends another year, not with a bang, but with a burger sizzle. And where do we stand? Well, like these final flyover maps, Cold War feels forgotten, both by us, the players, but also by the devs themselves. They played it safe, going back to a favorite subseries, using all the same mechanics we know and love, but they did it in a way that was completely devoid of any character, any life, and it made every little thing feel hollow, like it was always secondary to the real game, that, in my opinion, had already run its course. Oh guys, but they brought the Gulag back! Uh, never mind, greatest update ever. Totally gonna beat Battlefield 2042. And that's where I'll end today's tour. Thank you so much for watching. I also wanna shout out our $10 channel members, Gordo Rocos, Iju Cry, Sacred Moose, and Shane M. Thank you guys so much for your support. Now, if everyone can please exit through the gift shop, you can buy J Judge Dread, because that's relevant.